Okay. Bonjour, bienvenue, welcome to the penultimate session of our bilingual course uh, commemorating the ILO centenary entitled Transnational Futures of International Labor Law, La Justice Sociale dans le Monde du Travail. Je m'appelle Adèle Blaquette, je suis professeure de droit, titulaire de la chaire de recherche du Canada uh, en droit transnational du travail et développement. Et uh, je suis uh, uh, tenue ou uh, uh, encouragée, uh, contente de souligner que c'est grâce à une bourse de, la, de recherche de la fondation non partisane pierre Elliott Trudeau que cette initiative a vu le jour. Je tiens aussi à reconnaître que nous sommes sur la terre traditionnelle et non cédée de la Confédération Odnoshani, terre qui a aussi servi de lieu de rencontre entre plusieurs nations autochtones, y compris les Anishinaabe. Our theme for today is one that has come to emblematize both the aspirations and the concerns about globalizations. While we know that a range of other factors, including financialization, technological change, automization, artificial intelligence, shape the contemporary concerns, trade has been at the epicenter of the economic, philosophical, and yes, ideological claims of both possibilities and profound challenge for open societies. While some will insist that overall poverty levels have decreased with trade, a growing chorus of literature puts attention on the record levels of inequality both between and within states. Trade keeps our focus not only on how and where the distributive justice claims are, that is what factors of uh, production are, uh, as well as what factors of production are mobile, goods for sure, but what about people, um, and on issues of distribution, so who benefits from liberalization. And increasingly in this populist moment, we face a deepening, hardening disenchantment, multiple claims about who are the actual losers of trade in the face of an individualization of risk, as well as a reluctance to address serious questions associated with the very re redistributions, something um, that uh, has been thought about in terms of uh, thinking about regionalism um, at a uh, at social, uh, regionalism at a level uh, uh, that uh, considers uh, redistribution at that level or social regionalism. So fear, cynicism, and all too easy and reprehensible scapegoating has at times and in particular places taken the place of careful, deliberative, and progressive rethinkings. A course on the transnational futures of international labor law that centers social justice offers us an opportunity to look closely about at and about the legal and institutional frameworks that shape the way in which the interface of trade and labor have been understood and continue to be developed. The trade-labor interface has a particular important set of uh, features to it, uh, rules-based institutional frameworks uh, that at times the ILO and the current uh, rather imperiled WTO, former GATT, anticipated international trade organization operating internationally and multilaterally, respectively, uh, with mandates to shape what some have referred to as the rules of the game for a fair globalization. The issues of normative coherence abound. The field also centers multi-level governance and more specifically invites reflection on the appropriate governance level for addressing both the international architecture and the distributive justice concerns that arise. So many of us consider that if ever there was a time and a field in which the ILO's constitutional mandate needed to be drawn upon for guidance and for space creation, for dialogue, it is in the trade and labor interface. Today we have the opportunity to listen to two leading trade law academics, Professor Joanna Langell and Professor Alvaro Santos, who have studied closely the specific question of policy space for domestic governments in the light of multilateral and regional trade. Professor Langell has also kindly offered to integrate a bit of a WTO primer into her presentation today. And finally, we are honored to have with us by video conference the director of the ILO's Labor Standards Department, Corinne Varga, who will uh, comment on the presentations. I will introduce each of the speakers in the order in which they will present. So first, Joanna Langell joined the Faculty of Law of the University of Western Ontario as an assistant professor in 2018. 
Professor Langell is also a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation scholar. Uh, her research focuses on private international law, international trade law, private law, and legal theory. Prior to her appointment at Western, uh, Professor Langell was a Furman Fellow and an Institute for International Law and Justice Fellow at NYU New York University School of Law. She has held visiting research positions at Yale Law School, the University of Groningen's Philosophy Department, and the University of Toronto's Monk School for Global Affairs. She's consulted for parties and authored amicus briefs at a variety, in a variety of WTO and North American free trade agreement disputes, and has worked with the World Trade Organization and the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. Professor Langell also clerked for the judges of the Court of Appeal for Ontario and is licensed to practice law both in New York and Ontario. Uh, she's originally from Nova Scotia and has an undergraduate degree in philosophy and a political science degree from the University of Toronto. And as a Commonwealth scholar, she obtained a Master of Philosophy in International Relations at Bellow College at the University of Oxford. She received her JD from NYU Law, where she studied as a Furman Scholar and an Institute for, in, uh, for International Law and Justice uh, 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 transnational future uh, 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 for inter sorry uh, Furman School and an law. Institute of International <laughs> Law and Justice scholar <laughs> and it's because I've wanted to say something very particular about her doctoral studies where she was a Shirk Bombardier scholar and so I've saved this particularly happy news for the last earlier this very week Professor Langell successfully defended her doctorate in law her SJD at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law so please join me me in extending a hearty congratulation as well as a warm welcome to Dr. Langer. Well, thank you so much, uh, Adele, for having me today and for that extremely generous uh, invitation. I promise I did not pay her to say all those lovely things about me or to get a congratulations from all of you on my doctorate. This week just keeps getting better and better. So thank you all so much for your very warm welcome today. It's really a pleasure to be here at McGill and it's such an honor to be t participating in this series as a part of celebrating the ILO's 100th anniversary. I'm extremely honored and thrilled to be here today. Uh, a huge thanks also to Corinne out there in, the sci in cyberspace uh, for being willing to offer remarks on my paper. I'm really looking forward to hearing them uh, after I give my talk today. Thank you so much for taking the time. And a huge thanks, of course, to all the students in the class who are willing to read my paper. Uh, I really uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to email me as I try and improve it for publication. So uh, I'm really looking forward to learning from all of you. Okay, so. What am I doing today? So the subject of my talk today is the legal relationship between the multilateral trading system and labor law. So by the multilateral trading system, I mean the law of the World Trade Organization and its predecessor, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or the GATT. Okay, so this means I'm not gonna be speaking to you guys today about the legal relationship between trade and labor in bilateral or regional trade agreements. So uh, agreements between two or more uh, members of the international community, but non, those at, not at the multilateral level. I'm just focusing at that multilateral level today. I'm gonna leave uh, it to Alvaro to speak to the bilateral and regional aspects uh, of the trade labor relationship. I should also say before I begin that I'm not a labor lawyer. Uh, so there is a famous labor lawyer with my last name, Langell, uh, but he must not have been available today. Or perhaps Adele emailed the wrong Langell in her address book or something like that. So unfortunately, you've just got me. I am just a simple country international trade lawyer. Uh, and so I'm speaking to you from that perspective today, uh, exploring how the work I've done on international trade intersects with labor issues. Uh, um, so you all know that I'm not an expert uh, in what I've come to speak to you here today about. I'm just teasing. Um, okay, so what is my main claim today? What am I going to try and argue for you uh, in my time today? Well, the, the claim I'm going to make is as follows. The standard view of the legal relationship between the multilateral trading system and labor law is essentially that there is no legal relationship between those two domains. 
So on this view, since the, since the text of the WTOs, what covered agreements, so the treaties that make up the law of the World Trade Organization, since they don't directly address labor matters explicitly, the standard view is that the WTO has not taken any legal action on labor matters at all. But in my talk today, I'm going to argue that there's more than meets the eye on labor issues at the WTO. In fact, in my view, the WTO's legal disciplines are deeply connected to labor issues. The social is deeply implicated in the multilateral trading system. And I'm also going to argue that the particular way in which the WTO's jurisprudence has developed, that is, its legal case law has developed, has important implications for the ability of states to take action to protect labor, both at home and abroad. So that's the claim today. So to support this claim, I'm going to do four things in my talk today. First, I'm going to start by introducing the two different ways, the two, two different conceptualizations or images that scholars have used to understand the legal relationship between the multilateral trading system and labor law. The second thing I'm going to do is provide a very brief introduction to the WTO as an institution, since we're all, so we're all on the same page about kind of what this thing is that we're talking about today. Third, I'm going to outline the kind of core substance of the WTO's legal obligations. Uh, and I'm going to explain a, a little bit about how these legal obligations have the potential to limit a state's ability to regulate, to protect labor rights, both at home and abroad. Uh, fourth, I'm going to also discuss a recent change in the jurisprudence, or development, shall we say, in the jurisprudence of the WTO's appellate body. WTO's appellate body is sort of its, its uh, uh, appeals court, right, that's issued its most important jurisprudence. And I'm going to argue that the appellate body's jurisprudence has, uh, has kind of demonstrated what I've called a pluralist turn uh, in other writings. And this pluralist turn, I shall argue, has, an important, has important implications for the trade labor relationship. OK, so that's the map for today. Let's get started. First thing we're going to do today right, is to introduce these two views of the trade labor relationship. So I'm going to start by outlining the, the, the two ways in which the literature in the field has conceptualized the legal relationship between the multilateral trading system on the one hand and labor rights standards, the ILO, the kind of whole labor shebang on the other. So the first image of the trade and labor uh, relationship is what Brian Langell, the more famous Langell, has called the two solitudes view of the trade labor relationship. So I'm in Quebec. This should, this uh, two solitudes label should be very appealing for all of you guys. It should make sense. The basic thought, right, is that on this view, Trade and labor stand apart. They, the multilateral trading system is distinct from labor law because the legal disciplines of the WTO and its predecessor, the GATT, don't expressly address labor issues. And the WTO itself has given a lot of credence to this view. It, it routinely repeats that it doesn't deal with labor issues. You can see this on its own website. It says, we do not address labor law. That is not part of what we do, right? So, this is sort of the kind of classic view, right, is that labor law is not under the umbrella of the WTO at all. And thus, trade and labor are two solitudes. And from the point of view of many labor scholars, um, this is a very unfortunate divide. So many labor scholars and activists have looked at the multilateral trading system with a sort of envy, with like heart eyes. You know, they've looked at it with kind of desire. They've thought, oh my gosh, the WTO, it's so fabulous. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why they think it's so fabulous. And they, the reason why they kind of think that have this very heart eyes view of the WTO is because the International Labor Organization, as you know, the kind of primary organization uh, devoted to creating international, I don't need to tell you guys this, you're going to tell me about this today, right? Devoted to creating uh, labor conventions and establishing core labor rights. Uh, the ILO relies on shaming and persuasion, essentially, to get states to comply with their international labor commitments. But by contrast, the WTO, with its legally binding rules, its highly juridical dispute settlement system, and its enforcement through state countermeasures, appears to possess the enforcement mechanism 
that the ILO has always lacked. So the thought is that the WTO might be able to provide the teeth that the ILO lacks. And so, what scholars argue, while the WTO's legal disciplines don't currently address labor issues, labor should be added to the agenda of the multilateral trading system directly. That is, scholars have argued that trade and labor should be linked, with trade between nations being conditioned in some sense upon compliance with labor standards. And there are a range of different proposals for the way that linkage would take place. So in short, scholars who adopt the two solitudes picture want to get the WTO in the labor game directly. They see the WTO is outside of the labor game and they say, we want to invite it in. We've got to get it in the labor game. So for scholars who take on this view, the WTO uh, on the political side of things and the legislative side of things has been an exercise in disappointment. Because despite many calls for linkages, which persist to this day, the WTO has taken no explicit action to condition trade on compliance with labor standards. Uh, in essence, the WTO has taken no legislative action on the labor file at all. And thus, from the two solitudes picture, there appears to be no hope for the integration of the trade and labor agendas. However, there is a second view. This second view offers a rather different conception of the trade labor relationship. And this image is one of deep interpenetration of trade and labor, despite an explicit lack of textual connection between the law of the WTO and labor matters. So as scholars such as Rob House, Adele Blackett, Gabrielle Marceau, and Brian Langell have argued, the, the ability of states to take action to protect labor rights and standards very much has the potential to be affected by the law of the WTO. So even though the WTO doesn't mention labor in any direct sense, its disciplines could have a very uh, kind of profound effect on whether states can take action themselves to regulate labor matters, both at home and abroad. So from this second image's perspective, it's not, the issue is not that the WTO should get in the labor game, Instead, the WTO should make sure to get out of the way so that states can take action to protect labor themselves. The WTO is already in the labor game, right? So this, this image is very different than the two solitudes perspective. And in my view, and as I'm going to argue uh, later in my talk today, this second conception of the trade labor relationship is much more accurate. I think that's a more accurate picture of the legal relationship between the multilateral trading system and labor today. And I'm also going to argue uh, that if we adopt this image, there have been important developments in the labor file at the WTO that actually may have gone unnoticed. OK, so now I'm moving on to the second part of my talk today, which is just a very brief introduction to the WTO as an institution. So with these two uh, kind of conceptions of the trade labor relationship out of the way, we can focus more specifically on what the WTO's legal obligations are and how they might conflict with labor law. And as I say, I want to begin by providing just this very kind of brief high-level overview on the WTO as an institution. So what is the WTO? Well, the World Trade Organization is an intergovernmental organization that regulates trade in goods, services, and intellectual property among nations. However, the WTO was not the first multilateral trading regime. It actually evolved out of an earlier treaty called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or the GATT, which remains today, even though it was signed in 1947, the most important agreement for regulating trade in goods within the WTO umbrella. So as I say, the GATT was established uh, in the late 40s in the post-war period of economic reconstruction. And the GATT was a legal response to the disastrous economic policies of the interwar period in the 30s when states adopted what are called beggar thy neighbor approaches to kind of economic development that attempted to discriminate in favor of domestic production and against foreign production, essentially. Um, and so those policies ended up being quite bad. We had this thing called the Great Depression. It wasn't very good. It maybe caused the Second World War. Things were not happy. Uh, and so the GATT was like, this is not a good idea. We don't want that to happen again. 
Uh, so the GATT, uh, to that end, primarily targeted uh, tariffs and other border measures that were used to discriminate among one's trading partners or in favor of domestic production. That was the heart of what the GATT wanted to solve as a problem. The GATT started with just 23 members uh, and only dealt with trade in goods. But over the course of the 20th century, the GATT's membership and its subject matter coverage gradually expanded over a series of what are called rounds of negotiations. So the most important one of these rounds of negotiations was called the Uruguay Round. It took place in the late 80s and the early 90s. And this round of negotiations culminated in the creation of the WTO as a permanent institution uh, designed to regulate trade, as opposed to the ad hoc treaty regime of the GATT. And I'm sure you know this, but uh, the, GATT, the WTO whole, uh, is kind of housed in what used to be the ILO's building, uh, as Alvaro's paper uh, shows us, to, tells us today. So the, the WTO was also given a permanent institutional home. It had been there as the GATT, but it kind of took over this beautiful building that was previously inhabited by the ILO at that time. Um, so this move also to institutionalize uh, the regulation of international trade in the WTO also included a greatly strengthened dispute settlement mechanism. So this was really central to what states were doing when we moved from the GATT to the WTO. Um, this included a permanent appellate body, like an appeals court, as I say. Um, it, it involved kind of being able to make WTO law more binding at this point through various mechanisms. Uh, and so this was a greatly strengthened institution we saw when the WTO was created. The move from the GATT to the WTO also greatly expanded the subjects that were covered by the multilateral trading system. So in addition to incorporating the obligations that were already imposed by the GATT, the WTO also included a series of new multilateral agreements. So these included uh, trade in services, intellectual property, technical regulations, sanitary measures, like basically it became trade law regulation everywhere. And perhaps the most important, or I think one of the most important of these agreements is the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, which despite its unsexy name is actually very important for our understanding of uh, how trade is regulated today. And I'm gonna say more about that later. So these agreements that came into place when the WTO was formed were designed to go beyond the GATS, narrow mandate of reducing tariffs and preventing discrimination in, in trade and goods to reduce barriers from so-called beyond the border measures, including domestic regulation. So this was a different picture of liberalization that was ushered in at the WTO era. And I'll also say a few more words about that in a minute. But that's kind of a brief uh, Cole's notes on the WTO. So with that background established, I want to move on to the third part of my talk today. And here I'm going to talk about uh, the core legal obligations of the GATT slash WTO and how they implicate labor. So now we know a bit about the background, we can kind of move on to focus on the law itself. And in particular, I want to show uh, how the basic obligations of the WTO have the potential to limit the ability of states to regulate to protect labor rights or labor standards both at home and abroad. So again, this is my claim is that even though the WTO's legal texts don't directly address labor matters at all, in fact, implicit in those obligations uh, are legal disciplines that could have a quite significant effect on labor, especially when these uh, provisions are interpreted to their fullest, to their kind of most rigorous extent. And I'm going to discuss kind of three aspects of the WTO's legal disciplines and how they have the potential to intersect with labor. And I'm going to have to do this at sort of a high level of generality, uh, but we can talk a lot more about this during the conversation period and the part there's more detail in my paper as well. But hopefully this gives us kind of some sense of how knitted together trade and labor actually are. So the three things I'm going to talk to you about are first, the GATT's foundational non-discrimination obligations. So I alluded to those. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk about is the GATT's general exception provision. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. And third, the core obligations of the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, or the TBT Agreement. So these three aspects of international trade law, in my view, are, are kind of the key place, three examples of where we can see a strong connection between international trade regulation and labor. So let's start by discussing the GATT's core non-discrimination obligations. 
So at the heart of the GATT system, I've told you, is the idea of non-discrimination. So what does that mean? Well, the thought is that in a state's domestic taxes and regulation, states aren't permitted to discriminate between their trading partners or in favor of domestic goods over imported goods. So you have to treat everyone equally. That's the thing. You have to treat goods from everywhere equally. And the technical way that the WTO describes this is states have to treat like products from all WTO member states the same. You, basically, the idea is you can't discriminate among goods based on where they're from. And so, okay, and this is, an, this is both a de facto obligation and a de jure obligation. What does that mean? So this uh, is, you can't have discrimination that, is, that says uh, we are going to discriminate against, uh, obligation, against products from country A. And you also can't have a regulation that implicitly discriminates against country A, even if it doesn't name country A. Okay, so the thought is, this is the core obligation that the GATT is all about. And this non-discrimination obligation, in my view, has the potential to affect action taken to protect labor rights. So let's say that one state, like let's say country A again, wishes to take action against goods made through, country, through child labor in country B. And let's say, uh, you know, it's very clear that this country B is violating the ILO's, well, the relevant ILO convention, conventions on child labor, um, core labor right, of course, as well. And it, there's gr evidence of gross violations of child labor abuses in country B. So country A bans the importation of products potentially made with child labor from country B. But unfortunately, uh, depending on how we read the GATS, non-discrimination obligation, there's a strong likelihood that this would constitute discrimination in violation of the GATT. Why? Well, because the importing state, country A, is treating goods differently based on the fact that they came from country B, in some sense, arguably. Um, this is slightly more, there is a slight, slightly more complicated gloss on this. It's not clear that that's how you have to read the non-discrimination obligation, but arguably in one reading of non-discrimination, any attempt to ban those products would simply be GATT impermissible. And so this seems like a really big problem. And there's another kind of even bigger problem in the kind of core obligations of the GATT. So a related obligation to non-discrimination is what's called the quantitative restrictions obligation of the GATT. So that sounds very technical. But all it means is basically you can't ban things from other countries. So uh-oh, a, a ban. Uh, would, would look very bad on that article of the GATT. So this type of uh, kind of economic um, activity can really quite easily run afoul of the GATT's central obligations. Okay, so that's kind of, I can say much more about that in our, in our kind of time for discussion, but that's a cut and dry way in which non-discrimination obligations crash right into quite sensible action, we might think, um, to regulate labor rights and to try to ban products that were produced in a way we think is impermissible. So a second aspect of the GATT that's relevant to the ability of states to regulate to protect labor rights is GATT Article 20. And this is the so-called general exceptions clause of the GATT. It's an extremely famous part of the agreement. And this uh, provision allows states to justify otherwise GATT inconsistent measures or trade restrictive measures on the grounds that the measures were taken for some important public policy object objective. And Article 20 contains a list of those public policy objectives. So you, the state can restrict trade to uh, protect public morals, health, the environment, natural resources. It kind of gives a set list. Now, labor, uh, you, as you may well have guessed, is not mentioned among the public policy justifications that one can use for restricting trade in Article 20. But there's hope. Because Article 20E allows states explicitly to justify trade restrictive measures on the grounds that they relate to products of prison labor. Okay, that sounds like a little labor-y, you know what I'm saying? That's like got some labor flavor to it. So one might assume that a purposive interpretation of Article 20 might allow us to uh, include labor measures on a variety of issues uh, on related to forced labor. One might also think that article, let's say Article 20A, which is about the public, which allows states to take trade restrictive action on the grounds of public morals. Well, that sounds very exciting as well. That sounds like it might be a great source 
of uh, la labor measures. Likewise, Article 20B, which is about public health. A lot of our labor regulation has to do with health concerns. We might think that too is another uh, cause for celebration for the labor regulator. But for various reasons, uh, scholars have argued that it's, it's very uncertain uh, whether WTO adjudicators would allow Article 20 exceptions to be used for labor purposes. And there are a range of reasons why that I outline in the paper, but I'll just highlight one of them. Uh, one of the kind of big concerns that folks had was, it, until recently in the WTO uh, case law, and I'll say more about this in a minute, it was very uncertain whether Article 20 would allow states to adopt uh, what are called non-instrumental moral justifications for their regulatory action. So what does that mean? Well, that means moral justifications that are not aimed at um, producing certain consequences, but are instead aimed at expressing moral disagreement or condemnation of a certain practice. So they're not trying to actually consequentially achieve a certain end in the world, but rather they're expressing a deontological objection to a certain type of practice from a moral perspective. And so the thought is, was for a long time, that the WTO would actually not be very favorable to this type of moral regulation. And this is particularly salient to the labor context. Because a lot of the time uh, when we take labor action, it's very uncertain whether banning a particular product is actually going to have any consequential effect, let's say, on the use of child labor in a foreign state. It's very unclear whether there's an instrumental or consequentialist relationship between such a ban and the policy that's occurring in state in country B, right? So often we might want to justify that action on a kind of non-instrumental moral grounds, that it's just morally wrong to buy products that were made from children, point blank. And so there was a sense that this type of, for a long time, that this type of regulatory justification would be problematic from the perspective of Article 20. So the worry, of course, is that Article 20 essentially won't be available in the labor context. Okay, so that's point two, uh, the second connection between trade and labor. The third uh, thing I want to speak, say a few words about, uh, is the, uh, the technical barriers to trade agreement, so the TBT agreement. So the TBT agreement represents a new paradigm of trade liberalization efforts. Instead of the GATS focus on non-discrimination and protectionism as an impediment to trade, the TBT agreement seeks to eliminate barriers to trade that come from regulation itself, even if that regulation isn't discriminatory. So essentially, any domestic regulation we pass has an effect on trade. So if Canada passed a regulation today on, let's say, washing machine safety, uh, this would have an effect on uh, the sale of washing machines uh, from all around the world into Canada, right? Because we would be saying, these are our safety requirements for washing machines, and you better require, you better comply with them, right? And this is going to have, in theory, some trade restrictive effects. So what the tr technical barriers to trade agreement says is that uh, regulation domestically has to be minimally trade restrictive. And in addition, states have to make sure that they adopt regulation to the extent they can that coheres with how other states have regulated. So this is the idea of regulatory coherence. And as such, um, as scholars have argued, that these TBT obligations to these effects, as I've described, have a significant potential to limit the ability of states to take purely domestic regulatory action to regulate labor rights and standards. Uh, and even when it's not discriminatory, this can have a real kind of corrosive effect on the ability of a state to regulate. Because of course, uh, and so in addition, the TBT agreement also goes beyond the GATS basic non-discrimination obligations that I told you about. Because it imposes the same obligations not to discriminate among foreign products or in favor of your domestic products, but it does so without an Article 20's general exceptions provision, which is amazing. So it takes away directly the policy space that was reserved to states to restrict trade on the basis of an important public policy reason. So of course this too has a very important potential for the labor context, right? If we can't have access to those Article 20 justifications, what's a state to do? Okay, so let's step back for a minute and summarize. So my claim thus far is that while the WTO's legal disciplines don't on their face address labor issues, many of the core uh, obligations that are kind of included in the WTO have a, have a really strong potential to affect how states 
regulate to protect labor both at home and abroad. Okay, so now we're moving on to the fourth and final part of my talk today. I'm almost finished. Uh, what, what I'm gonna do in this final part of my talk today is I'm gonna explain how recent WTO appellate body jurisprudence has blunted the potential effects that WTO law can have on the ability of states to protect labor rights. So, in a series of articles and in several amicus briefs to the WTO, uh, Professor Rob House and I have begun to articulate what we call a new pluralist approach to interpreting the law of the WTO. And this pluralist approach, uh, and I should say, I know pluralism is a very loaded word at McGill, so if this is not a clear use of the term, this is not the McGill use of the term pluralism, okay, guys? We're gonna, we're gonna say this is a, a, a Langell and House use of the term pluralism, and we can fight about whether it complies with uh, the McGill use of the word pluralism later on, which I look forward to talking about. But anyway, the thought is, okay, that the appellate body has sought to develop what we call a new pluralist approach to developing the law of the WTO. And we argue, uh, we are both defend this position normatively and we argue that it offers a good description of how the law of the WTO can be best justified and explained. The essence of our pluralist approach is that the WTO law should be interpreted in a way that permits states to retain their regulatory autonomy. So what does this mean? This means the ability of states to regulate for reasons that they consider to be important. And we argue that while the WTO can legitimately place limits on the means that states use to regulate, it, that is, it can insist that states don't regulate in a protectionist or a discriminatory way, in our view, the WTO can't place limits on the ability of states to regulate in the first place. We also argue that the WTO's legal disciplines shouldn't limit the type of reasons that states can rely on when regulating. And so it should permit, we argue, what we've called regulatory pluralism. So this means that perhaps for the obvious, for the obvious exception of Jus Kogan's norms, there are essentially no philosophical uh, principles or industrial perspectives that are per se off the table of WTO law. That's our view. And this is, of course, just a brief overview, a taste of the view today. I'm, of course, happy to say more about this as well. So as I say, Rob and I have not only defended this position from a normative sort of standpoint, we've also argued that it, it does a great job of capturing the law of the WTO. Um, and we argue that the appellate body uh, has, in fact, uh, in recent days, uh, partly due to our urging, we hope, uh, through amicus briefs that we've submitted to the court and that have actually been cited there, um, adopted this pluralist perspective that we've sought to establish. So uh, as I say, there's strong evidence of this pluralist turn. And in my view, this pluralist turn has carved out substantial policy space for states to, uh, to be able to regulate for reasons that are important to them. And, in, and for a wide range of reasons, including those non-instrumental moral reasons that I told you were so important um, to think about. So, so we have sort of, in a, a series of articles, tried to establish that this turn has taken place. And it, this turn has sort of numerous dimensions. I for, unfortunately can't go through them in all detail today. But I want to argue, and as I argue in my paper, I believe that this pluralist turn has significant implications for the legal relationship between trade and labor. And I'm going to highlight three aspects of this pluralist turn that, in my view, uh, tell a, quite an interesting story about where we are now on the ability of states to regulate, to protect labor. Okay, so three aspects of the, WT, the appellate body's jurisprudence. So what's the first one? Well, the first uh, kind of change I want to point to is that in recent cases, the appellate body has used Article 20, that's that general exceptions clause I told you about, to significantly protect the regulatory autonomy of states. And it's done this in a range of different ways. So it's held that states have what they call an inherent, quote, right to regulate that the WTO doesn't inherently abridge or doesn't fundamentally abridge. They've also affirmed the right of states to set their own, quote, level of protection from risk. So this means that states can set, uh, can, can regulate sort of for whatever level of uh, risk regulation they want to, so nothing is sort of off the table. It's very important in allowing a kind of diversity of perspectives on regulation. 
We've also seen in cases like the seal products case, which I've written a lot about, the appellate body adopt a broad and a deferential approach to interpreting the public morals clause of Article 20A. So seals established that states can regulate for morally diverse and morally complex reasons, including non-instrumental reasons. And the case deferred to a state's own ability to define what counted as its public morals, very importantly. So in my view, these changes in the Article 20 case law have very fundamental implications for labor rights. And in my view, they open up the possibility that morally motivated action on labor rights violations, both instrumental and non-instrumental, would be found WTO compliant. And this, uh, I have to say, was one of the original objectives of scholars advocating for bringing labor law to the WTO to have a social clause that would allow this type of justification. And in my view, we may have arrived at a moment where the WTO is offering that type of policy space to states. The second area in which the WTO's appellate body has taken a pluralist turn is in its jurisprudence on the TBT agreement. And this has been an extremely radical jurisprudence. And I urge you to read more about it, because it sounds boring, but it is extremely interesting. Because in a trio of cases released in 2012, and in a number of cases since, the appellate body has basically read away the entire TBT agreement. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but they've done a lot to blunt its most significant deregulatory effects. And they've done this in numerous ways. So remember I told you that the TBT had a non-discriminative obligation that didn't contain a general exceptions clause? Well, they just read one in. They just read one in. Oh, you get that general exceptions clause. TBT non-discrimination, it's just the same as the gap. Fascinating. It doesn't say that on the text, but that's now the meaning of the agreement. The appellate body also significantly read down the obligation on states to regulate in a matter that's efficient or that has the least trade restrictive effect. So very important reading down of the obligations. The appellate body has also arguably started to limit the scope of the, the TBT's application, finding that certain measures don't constitute technical barriers to trade. So a certain moral measure was recently found not to constitute a technical barrier to trade. And so the, the TBT agreement didn't even apply. So these developments cutting back and blunting the TBT's obligations, of course, have a significant upshot in our labor context. In my view, they've diminished the threat that the TBT agreement posed to purely domestic labor regulation. And I've really uh, kind of, thank you, uh, have, have sort of um, removed this as, a, as one of the potential threats to uh, our ability to regulate, to protect labor. Okay, so the third point I want to make about the appellate body's jurisprudence. There's one important part of the AB's jurisprudence where, in my opinion, they have not accepted my urging to adopt a pluralist perspective. So the, the, despite the best of my abilities, they haven't followed what I've been trying to get them to do. And this is in the law of non-discrimination. So the appellate body continues to take an extremely strict approach to protectionist and discriminatory domestic regulation. They will re If there's an, even a hint or a sniff or a whiff of discrimination, your measure is going to be in trouble. So in my view, this has significant implications for labor, actually. Because I think that this uh, retention of a very strict non-discrimination approach would actually really limit the ability of states to adopt social, so-called social dumping measures, um, which I can say more about. I'm sure you guys are now experts in this after this term. But the thought is uh, that these measures are arguably just a form of protectionism. And so likely, or in my view, plausibly might not survive GATT or WTO scrutiny. So I think those types of measures might be off the table at the WTO. So that too might be important for our conception of which labor uh, types of labor measures are permissible. OK, so that's the end of my legal analysis today. I'm going to now conclude. So what, did I, what was kind of the main claim that I want to leave you guys with today? Well, the main claim is that while the WTO doesn't explicitly address labor matters, the appellate body's jurisprudence and the way it's developed may actually have important implications for the ability of states to regulate to protect labor rights and standards. And in particular, I've argued that what Rob House and I have called a pluralist turn in the appellate body's jurisprudence has opened up 
very important policy space for states so that they can regulate for reasons that they consider to be important, including labor-related reasons. However, of course, a number of questions about the trade-labor relationship remain unanswered. It remains to be seen how the trade-labor relationship would actually be articulated in, the, in WTO law if a panel or the appellate body were to actually adjudicate a labor case. So all my analysis is purely speculative. The WTO could turn around and do something completely different, so that's your user warning for today with the legal information I have provided. Uh, so kind of a lot remains to be seen here. It also, uh, the fate of the appellate body is also currently up in the air with the United States blocking the appointment of appellate body adjudicators. So we could be starting a very different era of appellate body adjudication or lack thereof altogether. So this may be all consigned to sort of the dustbin of history and we may see new, no new development uh, in this area. I'm, I'm more hopeful than that, but that there is potential at this point for this to be the end of the road. We will therefore need to see how the precise contours of the trade and relation and trade and labor relationship unfold in this new era. Thank you all so much, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Professor Langell. You are continuing a Langell tradition of highly engaging presentations, so thank you. And uh, for on the McGill pluralism, um, to quote Melisaris, uh, there are as many pluralisms as there are pluralists, so <laughs> we're happy to welcome yours. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Alvaro Santos, who is a professor of law and faculty director of the Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in the Americas, Carola, at Georgetown Law School. He teaches and writes in the areas of international trade, economic development, transnational labor law, and <laughs> the future of NAFTA. He recently served as deputy negotiator of the, we had a few jokes about this, U.S. Mexico-Canada Agreement, or CUSMA, <laughs> uh, for the newly elected government of Mexico. And uh, Professor Santos is also co-editor of the forthcoming book, Globalization Reimagined, A Progressive Agenda for World Trade and Investment Law. And he is author of numerous uh, insightful articles and book chapters, including one uh, recently, uh, The Lessons for TPP and the Future of Labor Chapters in Trade Agreements, uh, that is in the book Contested Mega Regional Regulation, Global Economic Ordering After TPP. Uh, Professor Santos uh, serves on the editorial board of the American Journal of Comparative Law, the Journal of International Economic Law, the Law and Development Review, and the Latin American Journal of International Trade Law. He also teaches regularly at Georgetown's Global Trade Academy and Harvard's Institute for Global Law and Policy. And he has taught at the University of Texas, Tufts University, Melbourne Law School, Centro de Investigación y de Ciencia Económicas, uh, CIDE, and the University of Turin. Professor Santos received his LLB with high honors from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and an LLM and an SJG from Harvard Law School. Welcome to Miguel, Professor Santos. Thank you for being here. Bonjour, and uh, thank you, Professor Blackett, for the kind invitation and your kind introductions. Uh, it's really uh, an honor to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, it's also a real pleasure to share this session with Professor uh, Langell. And thank you to Corina Varga for uh, uh, commenting on our papers. Uh, so. Today I want to talk to you about uh, the new frontier for labor in trade agreements. Where are we at? What are the opportunities that are opening before us? Uh, what happened in the current debates and in current negotiations? Um, and so I want to start the talk by 
thinking about the current moment of globalization backlash, where I see two dominant approaches emerging. Uh, on the one hand, there is uh, this uh, push for economic nationalism, uh, unilateralism, and an idea of trade as a zero-sum game. Uh, we see that uh, in many actions that the Trump administration has taken, but also uh, the Brexit by the, by the UK and in the rise of uh, populist movements in Europe that have a similar outlook on trade and globalization. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a very common reaction is to see a defense of the global liberal institutions that we've created in the last 30 years or so, uh, trying to hold barrier and defend them as the best we can do and at the same time, uh, one hears arguments about why the benefits of uh, that type of global globalization need to be better explained. Uh, and why is it that uh, trade is not that much to fault, but the blame is elsewhere. So technological de development and innovation uh, that create disruptors in the global market. And so there's a sense that if we could only preserve those, ins those institutions and wait out the backlash, will, everything will be okay and we'll be on a good track again. So I wanna resist both of those impulses and those positions. Um, there's also, by the way, a sense that we equate this malaise or this globalization backlash with the, with the Trump administration, but we should remember that during the uh, campaign in 2016, uh, all candidates for the presidency were uh, coming out against trade, against TPP, uh, sort of already recognizing that there was a demand to change uh, trade agreements and institutions. So, so I think it would be a mistake to think that this is uh, a Trump administration program. Of course it is, because it's who is in the White House, but it wasn't really just the Republican Party. Um, and so my position is that we should use this opportunity to, to think about it as an opening, to reimagine and change the agreements and institutions that we've built, to take seriously the concerns of distribution that have to do with stagnant wages, job losses, lack of opportunity for cer certain sectors of the population, and to think as well about the policy autonomy for countries to regulate in a way that will further the public good as they define it, and their ability to experiment, uh, uh, undertaking what, is, what are now considered heterodox economic policies. So that, that's the plea that I wanna make today to encourage us to think beyond these two dominant emerging positions. And another common, um, argument from those who defend globalization is to say that the problems can be addressed at the domestic level, right? So yes, we have trade agreements, we have these institutions, those are working more or less fine. If you wanna address the, the problems of distribution, do that domestically. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that there's, uh, of course, a, a very, uh, an important kernel of truth in that argument, in recognizing that states have done have not done enough or nearly enough to compensate losers, to provide safety nets for those who uh, find themselves in a hard time because of the uh, global competition. But I would argue that that's uh, not enough and also that many of these effects are built in by the international rules that we've created that structure the incentives for the different global economic actors. And so that those are the rules that are shaping the market and we should basically Open them, open them up uh, for debate and reform so that those rules should also be up for grabs, not only uh, domestic uh, reforms. So with that in mind, I'm gonna divide my presentation in three parts. First, I'm gonna talk about um, the TPP, or what is now called CPTPP, uh, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership after the US withdrew, so it now has 11 uh, members, uh, and I'm gonna um, describe um, what was included in the TPP and what happened. Uh, second, I'm gonna talk about 
the USMCA or uh, Kuzma. I, I apologize that I'm going to be referring to it as the USMCA throughout the presentation. I know uh, we in Mexico call it Temec, so uh, we each have put our the name of our country first. Uh, but I'm going to be explaining what were the shifts from uh, the TPP to USMCA, what happened in between, and what's the outcome of, the, of that uh, more recent NAFTA update. And, and third, I want to sort of uh, think with you about some, um, some ideas about where this leaves us and where we should go from here, or we could go from here. Uh, so the first is the story of the TPP. And, and so one of the papers that, that I circulated was precisely telling that story. The main question really that I asked was, why is it that despite a clear progress, progression in trade agreements of including labor standards, where TPP was the most advanced of these agreements, uh, the labor movement in the United States opposed it? Uh, so, I have a chart here. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm, I, oof, I apologize because you're probably <laughs> not going to be able to see it. It's in the paper. You can use uh, some uh, binoculars to, <laughs> to look at the text. Uh, but, but I'll explain it to you. But basically, the, the idea here is we have a clear progression where if we start, if we go back to NAFTA, actually, it's a, it's a uh, an agreement that included a uh, labor side agreement in order for it to be uh, ratified in the United States. And um, if we look at what's been done since then, we can see a clear progression where first, the labor side agreement is not a central part of NAFTA, but in subsequent agreements, there is a labor chapter that it's a core part of the trade agreement. In NAFTA, we had a reference to countries' own domestic laws. That was the benchmark on the standard. We moved from there to having now uh, an explicit reference to ILO standards, right? The uh, ILO uh, declaration, of the, the ILO core labor rights that come from the uh, Declaration of Fundamental Rights and Principles. Um, so freedom of association, collective bargaining, provision on discrimination, provision on child labor, uh, and provision of forced labor. So those are included. Uh, we also have a shift where the, there's a dispute settlement system that can adjudicate those labor provisions. And finally, there are also available trade remedies for the violation of those uh, labor standards, right? So we see this progression. And so the question is, isn't this isn't this great? Uh, I mean, we are seeing progress. And so the answer to that in a nutshell is, well, if, if this is the gold standard of globalization, which it is in terms of the treatment of labor, uh, Professor Langell uh, told us the story about the WTO and how much resistance there was to make that linkage, right? So she's uh, writing really great scholarship exploring the policy autonomy that's available and that you know, countries have uh, carved out and that scholars like her have proposed, but it's not explicit, right? So these are all ways in which we at the WTO can make room for labor. Well, here you have them. They are explicit, they're contained in the agreements, they've been negotiated. So it is the gold standard of, of uh, globalization. And so you know, my, my response to that is that if this is the gold standard of globalization, then just as the gold standard for monetary policy was abandoned uh, in the 20th century, so this should also be abandoned as the gold standard, right? And, and the question is then, uh, what were some of the concerns or, or the critiques? Uh, so there were many. Uh, the labor movements, the labor movement in, in the US, I'll give you just a short summary, but they pointed out that there was a problem of definitional clarity in the uh, labor rights because the, it refers to the declaration. But of course, these rights have been defined and interpreted in the conventions with much more depth and clarity. And so why not include those 
rights as, have, as they have been elaborated in the ILO conventions? Uh, why leave them just at the level of the declaration which, you know, create vagueness and some degree of uh, indeterminacy? Uh, there were also complaints about uh, the um, self judgment character of these obligations. So, for example, countries uh, commit themselves to uh, maintain acceptable conditions of work, but acceptable for whom? They determine what is acceptable. So it's, it's basically a standard that varies and depends on each country's criterion. Uh, there's also weak protection on forced labor, so the language there seems ortatory, so there's a, uh, an obligation to discourage forced labor. Uh, so the AFL-CIO uh, in the United States made uh, the point kind of tongue-in-cheek that you can discourage forced labor by hanging a poster, for example, right? So that the meat of the obligations doesn't seem to be very powerful or very clear. Um, the, there's also an obligation not to derogate uh, labor rights, but that is limited to uh, special economic zones, for example. And then there's also questions about dispute settlement. So it takes a while for labor organizations or workers to be able to adjudicate a case, right? So the only case that's been adjudicated in a trade agreement, which was between the US and Guatemala, took about nine years. Uh, and so uh, that requires the state to take up the case and sue the other states. It's only state to state adjudication, right? And they contrast this to the treatment that investors enjoy, where they can basically sue a state directly, right? So they have a private right of action. There's a clear asymmetry there. But also, if you look at the language of what you need for a labor violation to be, a, to be justiciable, uh, there are also stringent requirements. So, and this came out in Guatemala. Guatemala. Um, interpreted the language of uh, in a manner affecting trade. That is that the violation has to be in a manner affecting trade and also sustain a recurrent course of action or inaction in a way that may be very hard for a country to basically argue that there's been a labor violation that's justiciable. In a manner affecting trade was interpreted as requiring that the labor violation gives a competitive advantage to an economic uh, competitor in the market, right? So that seemed to be a very high threshold. Um, OK, so this is just a, a brief summary of some of the main concerns with the TPP labor chapter. But I think more important than that, and this is where we get to the idea of, OK, maybe we should basically abandon the gold standard of, uh, of uh, globalization, if this is it, is that it's kind of odd to think that if you're interested in labor, the most you can do is create a labor chapter in a trade agreement. We're talking about one of the main factors of production and basically uh, conditions or a regulation of a factor of production that affects millions of people in the global economy, right? So in some ways, the labor chapter and the justification that we're doing well because we have a la labor chapter uh, seems to be a legitimating device for not changing much in a trade agreement. And so one way of thinking about it is, okay, imagine that you're concerned about labor conditions, that you want to uh, change the balance of power between capital and labor, that you want to do something about the way in which uh, worker rights are enforced in a country, that you want to disincentivize violations of labor rights, what would you do? You want to increase the, the leverage of workers. So what would you do if you didn't have this option of a labor chapter? Imagine that you can't negotiate a labor chapter. That's kind of off the table. So what would be the things that you would want to change in a trade agreement? What would be the areas that you'd like to uh, work on or reform? And I find that thought experiment helpful because then it takes away the idea that, okay, you can put all of this in the labor chapter and that will be a plausible solution. And so 
the labor movement in the US actually started to go in this direction by saying, well, there are areas in trade agreements that might be much more relevant to us than a labor chapter. Uh, for example, rules of origin. Uh, how do we stimulate the production of goods in our country or in our region? Um, investment. What's the, what are the rights, the substantive rights that we're giving investors vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we're doing workers? And also, there's this argument that, I, I think it's a, it's a content, contented argument, but the idea that if you give investors such protection by creating you know, an investment chapter in a trade agreement, you're actually providing an insurance for them when they go abroad, and that, that might incentivize outsourcing. Uh, the evidence between the existence of bilateral investment treaties or investment chapters and foreign, foreign direct investment is it's very debated. I think the evidence of a link is really uh, not clear. Uh, so in other words, there's no real, there's no clear evidence that having a treaty, a bilateral investment treaty, foments or, or attracts investment. But, but having an investment chapter definitely protects investors once they're there and also limit the constraints of what states can do, right? And so that's something that workers have been uh, now raising. What's this asymmetry of power? Another area, government procurement. Why can't you use the ability of the state to spend, which in many advanced countries is quite considerably? So, you know, the public sector represents, you know, uh, up to 40% in some advanced countries or even uh, more. And so that's a huge sector of the economy. Why don't you use that, uh, for example, to, to uh, provide economic stimulus and help domestic workers in moments of recession? Or why don't you condition with specific labor provisions the ability of this, of, of a, the private companies to sell to the government, right? So there's ways in which you can use pro government procurement, but the trend has been to liberalize government procurement and give everyone also uh, a chance to participate with obligations of non-discrimination. I mean, that's a plurilateral agreement in the, in the WTO, and not all the member states are parties to it. Uh, and also, you know, the rules change in regional trade agreements, but that's an area that might be used in the future. Uh, or currency manipulation, right? So the labor movement was also very, um, very concerned about the ways in which currency manipulation might affect, uh, you know, the availability of jobs and their ability to compete, given uh, the advantage that it might give to countries that are manipulating their currency. Uh, and again, you don't have to agree with all these, you know, uh, arguments or, or think that it's a good idea to, to uh, reform these areas. But I think they open up space for thinking about labor in ways that are not about uh, the labor chapter or what specific rights we might want to include uh, in, a, in such a labor, labor chapter. Um, I also think that an uh, unappreciated or underappreciated uh, aspect of trade negotiations that came out as a lesson in TPP was the um, possibility for domestic labor reform, right? So in the TPP, there were three labor consistency plans that the U.S. negotiated with Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei, where they actually uh, got Vietnam to agree to very substantive changes in their domestic labor regulations. So for example, to uh, end the monopoly of the official union and allow independent unions and allow them also to uh, charge fees, their union fees, or to allow for uh, foreign NGOs to provide technical capacity and capacity training, technical assistance. Uh, among many others, right? So that it is during the negotiations where you have space to uh, make important substantive domestic reforms that might be more important than anything that you manage to get here in the, in the trade agreement, uh, definitely in the labor chapter. And that this might be also 
something that uh, builds new stakeholders in, the, in a country that is reforming and creates interest to a company and basically defend that reform, right? So we saw that in the case of Vietnam. And then, very curiously, informally, the US pressure the government, the then government of Mexico, to do a constitutional reform, to do a labor reform, uh, which was astonishing because, you know, in Mexico, independent labor unions and um, uh, left wing parties had been trying to pass this reform and failing constantly, right? And all of a sudden, this reform happened like almost surprising them because the government that was negotiating and had the majority in Congress passed this constitutional reform. So it kind of fell from the sky for, to them. Uh, and it was huge. I, I'm going to talk about the implications of this reform. But what happened was that when the US withdrew from TPP, this reform was derailed, right? So there was a constitutional reform, but we needed the implementing legislation in a federal labor law. And then that went nowhere. Uh, and the same, to, not the same, but something also happened in Vietnam where those reforms didn't seem to go as far as they were originally intended. Now the fact that Vietnam also was negotiating a trade agreement with the EU uh, uh, made the government of Vietnam uh, willing to continue with labor reforms and declare that they were going to continue. But this is just a glimpse to uh, show how uh, there might be a way to use the trade agreements that might not be reflected here, but that may, might have serious implications for, for workers. Um, OK, so what happened in the USMCA? Uh, and as Professor Blackett said, uh, I need to put my cards on the table. I was uh, the deputy negotiator for the elected government of Mexico. And the views that I'm expressing here are my sole views. Um, it was really interesting to see how the U.S. government and the USTR had really taken on board some of these criticisms of the TPP in its negotiating uh, position. When we arrived to the negotiation, a lot had been negotiated already. We were uh, able to uh, participate in several aspects of the, of the treaty. Uh, and and one, of the, one of them was the labor annex. Um, and so I'll just mention uh, three things that I, that I think are important and take on some of these criticisms. One is the labor chapter, and particularly the labor annex. Another one is the rules of origin. And the third one is investment. So let me just briefly describe for you what happened there. So in the labor chapter, there was a deliberate attempt to relax the language and the threshold of uh, the terminology I had mentioned in a manner affecting trade and sustain a recurring course of action or inaction, right? With the ba background of the Guatemala case, basically, <coughs> the idea that you can't require such a high standard because otherwise it's going to be impossible to uh, adjudicate uh, labor violations in the, in the chapter. Um, and there are other aspects of the chapter that have to do, for example, with the protection of migrant workers and also an obligation to uh, prevent and combat violence against workers. Uh, so there are several innovations in that chapter. But I would say, by and large, the main uh, aspect of it is the labor annex uh, and that is basically a commitment by the government of Mexico to do an overhaul of its labor reform. So that thing that had dropped out of the picture after TPP was back in USMCA in the form of explicit commitments that actually describe what Mexico needs to do in its labor legislation. Uh, we were uh, in favor of it because it was very consistent with what the new government wanted to do in terms of domestic reform. But of course, it locks it in at the international level, right? Uh, it becomes an international commitment. And so what, are these, what is this overhaul? Uh, it consists of three main uh, aspects. The first one is that it basically shifts the dispute settlement from the labor and arbitration boards which are called juntas de conciliación y arbitraje, 
and they were basically the they were tripartite uh, boards, so just like the ILO, formed by government, uh, employers, and workers, unions, uh, that had representatives in the boards that adjudicated labor disputes. But that system became very problematic because it was part of the corporatist regime in Mexico that basically uh, developed into a system that uh, entrench official unions with the government uh, against independent unions uh, and also <laughs> made it very hard for independent uh, for workers to create new unions outside that official system right and it gave a lot of say to the executive power in labor disputes because they were not part of the judicial system they were part of the executive power uh, and so that that type of adjudication is going to disappear and move completely towards the judiciary. So now courts are, un are independent judges are going to adjudicate these disputes. So first big change. Second change, the Ministry of Labor was in charge of registering unions and registering collective agreements. That is going to end and now an independent autonomous institute is going to be in charge of performing that role. Again, they were clear ways in which the government interfere with union governance by deciding, you know, uh, what unions to register, but also uh, in conflicts over collective agreements uh, between two unions, it could also decide, you know, um, who, had, who had the ownership, or it could also decide what union leader, you know, had the majority and, and in many ways intervene in union governance. And the other aspect of the reform is that uh, many of these uh, decisions, so for example, if you form a, a union or if you fight over a collective uh, agreement, those have to be the result of free, direct, and secret elections that are going to be guaranteed by the institute. So there's a sense of the need for democracy at the workplace and in, in collective bargaining, right? Uh, and even though that was supposed to happen in many ways, it was really not uh, guaranteed. So these are very substantive changes, a huge overhaul. Uh, okay, I see my time is running short, so I'm gonna speed up. Um, <laughs> rules of origin. So the rules of origin determine the percentage of value that needs to be originated in the region to count as made in North America, right? So global production means that you get inputs from a lot of different parts of the world, but you need, you used to need 62.5% of the total value of the product to be originated in North America to enjoy the duty-free uh, tariff that we have. And now that's increased to 75%. So the idea is divert production from other regions, perhaps namely Asia, in, I'm talking about particularly automobiles, uh, to production in North America with the idea that that's gonna benefit workers here. Uh, there's a lot of other requirements, but the one that I want to just highlight for you is 40%, there's a 40% la labor value content. That means that 40% of the content of a good has to be, of a aut automobile has to be produced with wages of $16 an hour. That's, that's a very, that's, that was unheard of, right? So it's completely new. Uh, you know, from the point of view of Mexico, it's gonna require significant adjustments because the average wage in Mexico for manufacturing, I mean, for production in cars is $2.5 an hour. So it's impossible that Mexico is going to meet this uh, anytime soon. But of that 40%, 15% can be for research and development or IT. And those wages are around $16 an hour. So it's really 25% of the production of a car. And so that's going to require some adjustment. And if Mexico accompanies that with an industrial policy or with, with a strategy in coordination with the auto uh, producers. Perhaps there's also ways to develop more uh, 
local content, more national value for, for Mexico, right? That could help uh, the adjustment. And then the last thing uh, that's worth noticing here is investment. So there was a reduction of the scope of investors' rights in something that's sort of commonly called as skinny ISDS, right? So the, the labor, the, sorry, the rights for investors were reduced to only direct expropriation and non-discrimination rights, like national treatment and most favored nation. And there's also a requirement that you should go first to your courts uh, in ways that will uh, delay the expediency with which investors could sue uh, states in an arbitration panel. So basically, first, exhaust local remedies. Uh, now, there's still a carve-out for certain sectors that enjoy all the full protection of investors' rights, uh, which are named in the agreement, but they're basically oil and energy uh, telecommunications infrastructure, right? So those still enjoy uh, the full protection. But I think it's a step forward precise, precisely in this way of understanding the balance of power. Um, okay, so lastly, the, the last part of my presentation is um, what's the, what does the future hold or what can we make of these changes, right? And so I think a very important question is whether this is charting a new path for trade agreements uh, that really bring these areas for reform and I think that's an open question. Um, it's possible, I mean, I think that many countries were looking at the negotiation of USMCA as, a, as what could be a potential template for future negotiations with the United States, right? Um, now we're at a moment of ratification. So the agreement was signed last November, and now the question is, will it be ratified? I think the answer to that is uh, probably yes in Canada, certainly yes in Mexico. Obviously it's all open, but, but it's very likely th those two countries won the agreement. And the question is, what will happen in the US, right? With a new house that is now uh, majority the Democratic Party. And, and so the questions here would be, there are already, if you've seen the, some of the statements of the uh, Democrats, they're concerned about enforcement of labor rights. Uh, they're, some are asking to reopen the agreement to provide better means of enforcement. They're also following closely what's going on in Mexico. So I think the key question would be whether some of these concerns can be dealt with in the implementing legislation, that is in the U.S. implementing legislation for the agreement, or whether they need to be uh, done in the text of the agreement, uh, which will open up, obviously, a, s a whole set of other uh, concerns and problems if the, if the text is reopened. Um, I would say here also, and this is, again, my own personal view, but that there was a missed opportunity for the labor movement and labor organizations in the U.S. because all of what I've told you is basically focused on Mexico, right? And Mexican, and conditions of work in Mexico. But if you look at the history of NAFTA and all the cases that were brought under the NALC, the, the labor side agreement, there are plenty of cases of violations of labor rights in the United States as well. And of course we know by the reports of human rights organizations of different sorts that you know there are labor violations that is very difficult to organize and bargain collectively in the United States. And so, this would have been a really good opportunity for the labor union, to, the labor movement, to use this as a, as a pivot or as a platform to demand reform domestically in the United States as well. I mean, there are obviously questions of uh, power asymmetries in the negotiations and also questions of you know, the domestic political constraints. But that might be something Demo the Democrats might want to think about when, they, when they're thinking about what to ask in exchange for supporting the USMCA ratification. Um, so I think my time is up, but I would say one more thing, which is that um, this is also a good opportunity to think, so to think about how to rebalance the power between labor and capital in globalization. So what are the rights that we're giving 
what are the procedural rights of action, what are the remedies that we're giving parties. Uh, and, and, and then finally, to also rethink the way in which we've proceeded, particularly in NAFTA, in this very schizophrenic way we're thinking about liberalization and integration of the regional market when it comes to goods, services, and capital, but using a whole different lens and policy discourse when talking about migration, right? Uh, we're seeing that now at this very moment where on the one hand there's the, the, all the push for ratification or debate about the ratification of the treaty. On the, on the other hand, all these national security concerns and all this language on migration. And so I know that there are political constraints and considerations in bringing these two things together, but it's the work of and the role of scholars uh, to think about ways in which we can actually make a plea for, for integration, for normalizing the idea that labor mobility is a part of uh, a regional market, which happens whether you uh, deem it legal or illegal. And the question is, can we think about it in terms of how to organize those flows, how to regulate them, even if to make them more secure and to screen them better? But in what ways can we actually breach that divide and start bringing this aspect of globalization that's been left uh, behind and pushed aside for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Santos, for uh, the clarity uh, and depth of your insight today. Um, and I think your charge around uh, the negotiation of uh, uh, standards or uh, approaches that would uh, address labor in countries other than Mexico is one that uh, we should be hearing in the Canadian context as well. It's uh, uh, something that the kind of regionalism that is fostered through a trade arrangement um, can allow and can be negotiated. It's now my great uh, pleasure uh, to present uh, Corinne uh, Verga, une collègue qui a commencé sa carrière au BIT en 1988 et j'aimerais souligner le fait que Madame Verga est une fonctionnaire euh, internationale qui a développé un profil, une carrière euh, vraiment uh, spécifique, uh, plutôt rare uh, des fois, et qui influence uh, de façon uh, cardinale uh, uh, son approche aux questions normatives, aux questions juridiques au sein de l'OIT. Donc, c'est quelqu'un qui a servi dans plusieurs postes au sein de l'Organisation internationale du travail, de son secrétariat permanent, le Bureau international du travail, non seulement à Genève, où elle est actuellement basée, mais aussi dans plusieurs pays où œuvre l'OIT et donc euh, plusieurs pays en Afrique subsaharienne. Euh, elle a donc su développer une appréciation à la fois pour euh, euh, la façon dont les normes sont élaborées dans des contextes ou en tenant en compte des contextes multiples, leur implémentation euh, et la mise en œuvre de ces normes, y compris par une vision euh, accru développé de la coopération technique euh, euh, donc, euh, que, euh, au sein de l'OIT, une dimension que nous avons pu effleurer dans ce cours, mais qui est euh, souvent euh, sous-étudiée. Corinne Varga uh, has therefore provided technical advice on comparative labor law. Uh, and international labor standards to governments, to policymakers, to unions, to employers' organizations. She's facilitated a number of tripartite discussions around labor law reform. And uh, I'll take the liberty of underscoring one example from 1997 when she held and then co-edited the proceedings from a seminar uh, between the ILO and the World Bank. 
uh, both in Washington, D.C. and in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire, in which core issues like the meaning of flexibility in labor regulation were explored in high-level discussions with uh, quite receptive and interesting uh, outcomes. From 2014 to 2015, she managed the Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work branch and the ILO's Global Technical Cooperation Program to eliminate child labor, forced labor, and discrimination at work. The program also promoted the freedom of association and collective bargaining. Since July 1st, uh, 2015, she's been the director of the International Labor Standards Department, where she is responsible for the implementation of ILO standards uh, policy and the functioning of the ILO's supervisory bodies. Uh, and uh, as uh, you've seen in this course, since 1919, the ILO has maintained and developed a system of international standards aimed at promoting opportunities for women and when to uh, uh, obtain decent and productive work in conditions of freedom, equity, security, and dignity. Uh, I wish to therefore extend uh, sincere thanks uh, to Corinne Verga. C'est un honneur de vous avoir parmi nous uh, virtuellement et nous anticipons vos commentaires uh, pour les présentateurs. Merci, Corinne. Thank you so very much. Uh, is my voice coming through okay? Perfect. Okay, so what a pleasure joining you at distance. I mean, this is the beauty of technology in our current world of work. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. And I'm not only very pleased, but I feel extremely honored actually to, to be uh, joining your discussion today. And I want to thank in particular Professor Blackett, not only for inviting me to contribute to the discussion that has just been so eloquently introduced by both Professor Angel and Professor Santos, but perhaps even more importantly for having initiated this course on transnational futures of international labor law. At the ILO, we certainly welcome very much this contribution of McGill University to the ILO 100 centenary. So yes, we're turning 100 years in the ILO, um, and we are taking this moment to obviously review and reflect, celebrate the past and the current achievements, and I think we should. International labor standards have shaped in a decisive manner, I would argue, the development of national labor laws and practices around the world. And in that sense, building on one of the points made by Professor Langin in, in her paper, I think the ILO has contributed to creating communities of shared labor values and norms. But clearly, this is unfinished business, and the journey is not over. So, as we celebrate our centenary, we not only looking at the past and, and enjoying the celebratory moment, but we also take this moment to have a real candid look at the world of work today and the root causes of growing inequalities within and between countries, and as well as at the drivers of profound societal, societal transformation, climate, technology, demographics, migration in all forms, and trade, as we're discussing today. So we are resolute in seizing this opportunity to have this candid look with the view to building and contributing to building the future we want and we want to see happenings. And as we do this, we are also determined to reorient and readjust our priorities to the needs of today's world of work. So you will not be surprised to hear from me that many of the issues raised by both Professor Santos and Magdalene resonate very much with current ILO initiatives and with ILO debates. And the first testimony of this will be a short video of our ILO Director General, which, believe me or not, has not been produced purposely for your course, <laughs> has not been produced either to respond in particular to Professor Santos, but actually could have. 
So Emily, if you can now just put it on. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the International Labour Organization, it's very important for us, our governing body, to come back to what uh, was the first permanent home of our organization and is today the home of the World Trade Organization. It's a moment to look back over 100 years of history, of achievements, but also to look forward to the challenges uh, that remain. And I think that um, uh, along with uh, Director General Azevedo, we share a strong commitment to look for ways for the World Trade Organization and International Labour Organization to strengthen their strong partnership. It's difficult to imagine in these days when multilateralism is challenged in so many ways that one of our organization can succeed without the success of the other. And I think more and more people around the world are looking to a trading system that brings prosperity and brings jobs, and they're also looking to the International Labour Organization to reach out to its partners. So uh, today we're celebrating history, we're admiring the, the beautiful artistic work that the ILO left uh, here in the World Trade Organization business. It's a reminder that the worlds of labor uh, and the world of commerce are intimately linked and how much we have to do together. So, I, if you're hearing me, I hope you enjoyed this video, which, uh, and you would agree with me that it could have been produced only for your course, right? I mean, but this, you know, as I was reading Professor Santos' comments on, on his feelings about visiting Maya ruins, uh, I couldn't resist suggesting that we watch this video. And this video has been recorded last week as we were having our governing body, and we had that moment where we all went down to the World Trade Organization to um, open uh, an exhibition that's there to stay, reminding indeed the close links between both trade and, and labor policies and, and how these measures are, are uh, these policy issues are both linked. So, as our DG put it, um, the future we want is a trading system that brings prosperity and jobs. And it is in another way, putting the discussion we're having today in your course, putting it in, in a different perspective, a trading system that brings prosperity and jobs. And my discussion to, to our discussion and my comments on the two papers presented to us will evolve around three questions. First, bringing prosperity and jobs through credit calls for action beyond one single international organization and for policy coherence at all levels. And I'm going to elaborate on that point. My second point would be around the free trade agreement and labor standards and the labor chapters. <coughs> and I would counter argue that um, what is needed as opposed to more teeth is more incentives and more time. And my third uh, comment would talk about what kind of labor rights do we need to be promoting in the current world of work and take perhaps also a look at are international labor standards still fit for purpose with a view to or are they leaving some people behind and, and should, we, should we be doing something about that as well. So my first comment around this whole notion of you will not have trade delivering prosperity and jobs just by the action of one single international organization. Trade is only one of the drivers of development, albeit I fully acknowledge an important one. But as a recently uh, established Global Commission on the Future of Work, it concluded its work and it pointed out in its report that there are indeed strong and complex links between trade, financial, economic, and social policies. And it is for that very reason that the success of a human-centered growth and development agenda depend heavily on coherence across these policy areas. 
This is not something new. This is something that had already been acknowledged and called forward by Daniel in 2008 when it was adopting its Declaration on Social Justice for Fair Globalization. This was in 2008, we are 2019. 10 years on the road, one has to acknowledge that <coughs> nothing was made on that front, ensuring increase and better policy coherence in between all these policy areas. Hence, the renewed call for from the Global Commission on the Future of Work. And so this is an acknowledgement of the views that we have taken and defended by some, including Professor Langill and Blackett, that trade and labor are interlinked. That's very true. I think we, the ILO certainly fully support that view. At the same time, I've heard Professor Langill claiming that they both trade and labor operate in their respective solitudes, as she put it. And it was interesting to hear the proposal on how to bridge what I then reframed the legal solitude gap. How can one bridge this legal solitude gap and, and using the public moral exception that uh, Professor Langil uh, exposed to us? I, I had found, I was really interested and fascinated by the proposal. And so I asked myself, what are the chains of success of this approach? And here I would put two arguments for the discussion. First, I think what's being proposed brings us back immediately to the whole debate we had many years back about the social clause, which has led the World Trade Organization to take that firm position, which was referred to and which it mentioned on their website, World Trade Organization does not deal with labor. This is a matter for the ILO. And this is how that discussion concluded uh, when it was last discussed at the, in, in global forums. Um, so this is a path that was not pursued at the time because there was no political support for it. So my question really now is, would we think that there is more political support for this today than at that time? I doubt. If we're looking at the pushback on multilateralism, if we're looking at the pushback on what is perceived as external interference in domestic policies at all levels, if we look at the pushback of international organizations, scrutiny of countries, I don't see any prospects for having the slightest chance of having the political space for that proposal to be supported at the global level. These are facts. This is, don't understand this to mean that I'm taking position. I'm, these are just facts I'm observing from where I'm sitting. But should there be? Let's just imagine one moment that there be not political space and that this proposal is finding its way. Then I was asking myself, how would this operate in practice? And here I look at the, I mean, the first thing that came to my mind concerned the operational challenges of implementing the proposal put forward to us. A ban on goods produced by child labor. If we take that word in hypothesis, and a country seeing their products banned because they are produced by child labor, and that claim is being made. And, and then is being argued and counter-argued because if I understand the proposal is that one country would use the public moral exception to ban those products from, from reaching its territory and then the, the country, the producing country would then counter-argue and possibly claim with the World Trade Organization that it had been subjected to discriminatory practices um, so the World Trade Organization finds itself in determining the facts of the matter. And then the first thing is, on who and on what basis 
will the World Trade Organization be investigating these allegations of these products being produced by child labor? What the ILO supervises in terms of compliance of the member states is very exceptionally focused on compliance with labor standards in specific industries. What the ILO is monitoring on a regular basis is how member states are implementing labor standards through their national law and practice across all sectors or across all industries. So you would rarely find any useful evidence coming out of the ILO supervisory system to support one position or another. So where am I going with this? I'm going to, to put to you that this would then call for some other bodies, other actors being tasked with investigation of these allegations with a view to determining whether indeed those products have been or have not been produced by child labor. And, and this comes with a number of potential risk as to who will, will then be assessing against against which, which standards, the ILO standards. So can, can another entity assess compliance with labor standards outside of the ILO? Are we going to be creating duplicate and parallel systems of supervision and investigation and determination of compliance with labor standards? Obviously, I'm coming with these operational questions as my main task and responsibility today is to ensure the operation of the ILO supervisory system. So I'm confronted on a daily basis with these operational kind of questions. So this would be my, my, two, my two comments to what is indeed a tempting uh, proposal made by, by Professor Langer. If I'm now... Um, if I'm now turning to, oh yeah, let me finish on that one because on this whole question of promoting policy coherence, so we acknowledge that there is a link between trade and, and labor policies, that we need to promote more coherence. Professor Langer proposed one way of doing this, but actually, interestingly, another way had been proposed by, and had been discussed and tabled for a proposal by, uh, by the ILO by the office at some point in time, soon after the adoption of the Social Justice Declaration for Fair Globalization. And there the proposal was to develop a new international labor standard that would commit member states to ensure policy coherence between their trade, financial, economic, and labor policies. So creating, using a different kind of legal device than the one proposed by Professor Langil, using international labor standards as creating a new legal obligation forcing member states to commit to increased policy coherence between trade and labor. When that proposal was stable, unfortunately, it received little support as well. And so for the moment, there is no such discussion moving forward. But it just shows that indeed there is space for creativity in, and, and also creativity in terms of what kind of legal response can be, can be put forward to address this uh, divide and and these two solitudes, as, as mentioned. Five more minutes warning. Thank you. So now my second argument, uh, free trade argument and labor standards. Our assessment of free trade agreements impact, it was in some part uh, the one that has just been presented by Professor Santos. Um, we would fully agree that there is much to be gained during the negotiation phase in terms of promoting, promoting national labor law reforms, as the example of Vietnam and Mexico um, suggest. In both countries, as a matter of fact, the ILO has been engaged uh, for many years in this discussion based on uh, well, those discussions were triggered and informed by the ILO supervision of how both Vietnam and Mexico were and are implementing their international obligation with respect to labor standards. And clearly, these negotiations in these two countries have increased the incentives for 
uh, reforms and uh, reforms of national uh, legislation and created also incentives for new ratification of international labor standards. In the case of Mexico, uh, the Convention 98 on uh, the right to collective bargaining has been uh, ratified on 23rd November 2018 and clearly came out of this negotiation, this trade negotiation, which created these strong incentives for the ratification of the right to organize and collective bargaining convention. Interesting as well to observe that Canada ratified that same convention in 2017 in a context where it was discussing the CETA program. And, and, and that's interesting because it also speaks to the argument that both parties engage in trade negotiations should take their responsibility or should seize the incentives in the same manner. Uh, and, and so Canada ratification is an, is an interesting positive example of that, that it's two-sided uh, and not one uh, unidimensional. But for me, more importantly, this is really pointing to the power of its incentives as opposed to sanctions or sanction-oriented teeth, which seems to be the argument Professor Santos uh, was going into. And, and clearly, um, in the ILO, we have heard this argument that we are lacking teeth, and we know the other Professor Langille argument that we are lacking teeth. Uh, and we have always um, standard by what has been part of what we now call even our DNA, that we achieved success and positive change at all levels by engaging in dialogue and in constructive engagement with our partners. Uh, constructive engagement and dialogue has really the power to drive positive, sustainable change. You cannot impose change on people who are resisting to engage with you and or who are resisting this change. It takes willingness to engage, it takes commitment to engage in a constructive manner, and it takes dialogue. Without these ingredients, sanction, even sanction will not deliver any results. It's really the, the best results and the more sustainable results we've been able to achieve through the life of our organization have been through dialogue and, uh, and constructive engagement. But, um, it's true that our methods, these methods, are calling for time to deliver results. But we claiming that that investment, that time investment, is worth and is paying off because then the outcome is more durable and lasts longer uh, than if you were to rush or impose changes on people because then they will resist the implementation of these changes and then you're confronted with problem later down in, in the chain of command. Uh, but at the same time, it's clear that one of our famous previous executive director, Karen Piola, used to say that there is no simple formula to determine when pressure works better than encouragement. And there is some balance there to find. Um, and encouragement works indeed on occasion much better when there is some pressure behind these encouragement. But uh, pressure alone is not delivering without any, any encouragement. How much more time do I have? Perhaps uh, I, I'll, I'll go now to my third point, perhaps quickly to leave some time for, for exchange. Just quickly on my third point, what kind of labor rights labor national labor law or international labor standards will we need today to be effective in promoting labor rights, ensuring that the labor instruments we have, our labor standards, are fit for purpose in a world of work that's under major transformation, with the employment relationship uh, being transformed so profoundly, showing the limits of an employment relationship-based regulation, which inevitably leads, certainly at international level, but also at national level, um, a number of people being left behind because they are not covered by the scope of these regulations. So this is a question we're taking very seriously as well in the ILO as, we, as we've prepared for a century and as we are going to 
continue your work after the century. So we've launched in the context of the century a number of initiatives, one of which is called the Standards Initiative. And one of the main objectives of that initiative was to ensure that as we turn 100 years, we ensure that we maintain a body of standards, international labor regulations that are fully up to date and relevant and responsive to the current world of work, and that we also have a supervisory system that's fully efficient to monitor the compliance of member states with these obligations in a manner that's fitting our current world of work. So we started the review of our 189 international labor convention and uh, the 200 five recommendation we have. It's not the first time we're undertaking this review, it's the fifth time in our history that we're undertaking this review. And this review aims at identifying those standards that are fully up to date, those that are outdated and need to be abrogated or withdrawn, and those that are calling for some action to maintain their relevance as the world of work evolves. As we do this, we also identify gaps in protection and interestingly, the Global Commission on the Future of Work has brought our attention to the importance of doing some work now on the regulation of the gig economy. So that's certainly an area that we're going to start working on. Um, and we are also looking at identifying time-bound follow-up action, which involves uh, involve promotion of ratification of the instruments, abrogation, withdrawal of outdated ones, revision of those instruments that are calling for uh, revision to maintain their burden, and also new standards setting. And my last point in relation to that, just for you to be aware, I'm happy to share more information that you'll be interested. We started a really interesting discussion in terms about the design of the future international labor standards. Um, we have constructed a, a body of international labor standards on a model whereby one subject is regulated by one instrument, potentially two if we have one convention and recommendation, but basically we have I mean, one theme regulated by one instrument. And if the issue that's being regulated, let's take occupational safety and health instruction, as involved and if that instrument is not for purpose, the only option we have is to go for a revision of these standards, which is a heavy process of for to ensure uh, continued relevance of our labor standards. While in national legislation, you have your national legislation, you revise your national regulate your national law, your national law of the past and as revised remains in force. At international level, the version revised convention remains in the So you have the initial convention, let's say convention two, just to give a number, and convention number two is revised by convention 87. <coughs> you would have in the area the corpus of standards, two instruments, and member states would have to move their ratification from the old instruments onto the new ones, calling for a number of procedure at national level as well. We have, with a recently adopted Maritime Labor Convention, devised a new formula for a simplified way of revising international labor standards, which are not calling for this constant re-ratification by member states of pre-ratified labor standards. So we're looking at how we can facilitates actually simplify the revision process and we're also looking at how we can potentially promote an incentivize and incentivize sorry um, innovative enforcement mechanism of international labor standards building also on the maritime labor convention but this is not the subject for today so just to conclude my point so yes trade and labor policies are linked clearly. And, but it, to ensure that trade brings prosperity and decent job, this calls for policy coherence across, across many different policy areas, but certainly across trade and policy areas, 
and accountability for ensuring that coherence between those two policies. In today's world of work, the only, the, the only space that I see at the moment being open for promoting this increased coherence between trade and policy is to consider positive incentives. I don't see much space nor much appetite for an increase in international pressure nor scrutiny of international organization. So, yes for the link, yes for the coherence, but through incentives and not through more scrutiny or um, sanctions. That would be my final comments. Hearing your presentation, uh, it came to me well, what I, I read uh, regarding the third world approaches in international law. Uh, lots of authors uh, work on this, these themes under those approaches. And of course, the question that they, they raise is that if, if there is not a danger by letting trade law or corporate law uh, orientate and guide the evolution of international labor, then when we talk about the WTO or even bilateral agreements, we're talking about balance of power. So the normative creation process takes into account this balance of powers that the, story, the history shows us can be most beneficiary for uh, global north countries or the transnational capital class. So I was wondering actually if uh, it seems unclear for me if the labor movement should spend time and energy in order, in order to make some evolution within this system or, as Dr. Santos said, uh, just actually touch on other issues within this same uh, legal framework, which are uh, investments or uh, outsourcing or distribution. So that's so more, more a question for Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So um, a lot of the trade rules that we're talking about uh, were designed at a time when production was very integrated uh, within nations. And since then, and I'm so, and incidentally, so have the labor conventions of the ILO in large part. And since then, production has disintegrated globally into what are called global value chains. And so how does this affect the debate? So we heard snippets of this here and there in the presenter's presentation, including on rules of origins and uh, the investment chapter rules and trade agreements. But I'd like to hear more if there is more to be said about how this changes the conversation about how to how trade and labor might intersect in a world of global value chains, where this could be FDI driven or driven by foreign direct investment or not, right? It could be global value chains of autonomous firms that are still in this chain relationship. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. So, okay. Yes. Um, I might ask Professor Santos to respond to the comments from Ms. Varga that we just heard, um, in that towards the end of your paper, you call for a reimagining um, of what that relationship between trade and labor could look like, especially given the imbalance of power. Um, and you note know, particularly the opportunities for change um, in the periods of negotiation before uh, the instruments are implemented. And so I'm wondering that, especially the call um, that we're looking uh, towards incentives as opposed to pressures and scrutiny, when given the power imbalance that one side maybe needs to be incentivized more than the other one, um, and how that could work not just reproducing that imbalance of power. 
three fabulous questions. Uh, shall we proceed in the order of the presentations? So, Certainly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you guys so much. That's fabulous. And uh, I'm sure this is just a first pass at answering these very, very helpful and interesting questions. Uh, but of course, we could speak more later. So the first question, um, which is, is, what, is it un, it's unclear whether labor should spend time trying to make any kind of moves or any evolution within these kind of trenchant capitalist frameworks. Why, you know, kind of the thought is, why bother? And I think that's very interesting. And, uh, you know, I, my first instinct is to say sort of, I'm not someone who is uh, within the labor movement and I'm, I don't feel well positioned to say sort of what strategies the labor movement should or shouldn't take. But I suppose um, my kind of thought on the legal relationship between the WTO and labor is that this is just a game that labor is in whether it likes it or not. Uh, and so I don't see why uh, you wouldn't play the game on every front you could play it in, right? And if, uh, and especially when I think there's been a receptivity to the type of social justice issues that, that labor cares about within the WTO in my, in my view. Uh, and, I, and, and I think there's space to leverage conceptions of development within the WTO. Uh, you know, my experience working there was that actually people are, it's not a hyper-capitalist, uh, you know, right-wing type of place. It's actually a much more development-oriented kind of subtle organization uh, than one might think. And so I think there's more room to play than you, uh, you know, might might uh, a skeptic might uh, think. Uh, so then on to the, se but, but I don't want to tell Libra what to do. I've been really not epistemically or normatively well positioned to do that. Uh, the second question, how do global value chains affect this debate? I think it's a really interesting question. I guess off the top of my head, I'm not sure if it would affect my analysis today. Um, I'm, but I have to think about it more. Um, I, maybe I, we can chat about if you thought there was a, some sort of implication and maybe Alvaro, you can, See if you think there's something at the uh, regional or bilateral stage, but I'm not. Sh I'm just trying to think of how that would interact with the legal argument I'm making, and I'm not sure that I can see it. But I'll have to do some more thinking about it because, of course, this isn't a sea change, right, in the way that uh, trade is organized empirically. Um, so I'm happy, happy to think that through. But maybe it doesn't change it. That's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I just right. haven't. Uh, it's on the non-FDI driven side, maybe it's just good flowing borders, and that's all that matters. So that's I mean, important. often, you know, the 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 measures that are going to draw this type of scrutiny are going to be goods crossing borders scenarios, right? So I and that's what we're interested in. I'm mm -hmm. interested in kind of allowing states to take action with regard mm -hmm. to, right? So I'm not sure. So it doesn't really matter what the rules of origin in, in ter are in terms of where the product came from originally or what have you. I'm just saying I want space for the states to be able to regulate, and yeah. that's the important bottom line. And we can cash out rules of origin, that kind of thing, in different ways. And that's highly integrated supply chain doesn't really affect what I'm primarily mm -hmm. caring about. Although, of course, regulation has, of course, been shifted by supply chains, but that's not, that's a different issue. Uh, uh, but there, there are economic pressures that result from this type of integration. But that's all I'm going to say, and I hold that over to you. I'll hand it over to you, Alvaro. Thank you. OK, thank yeah. you. Well, thanks for all these questions. So uh, Daniel, I would say, yeah, that's always uh, an interesting question on how to engage or whether to engage with the system to change it, to change the outcomes right, that are being produced. I would say that if there was a moment to engage with the system from within, it's this one, because there is a crack in the system that's very much coming from a dissatisfaction and a critique of industrialized countries that mm -hmm. have leverage. And so I, I would say there's an opportunity here. It will be, yeah. I think it will be a very sort of missed uh, chance to, to let go, right? To not engage. I share many of these uh, views of you know, how restrictive the trade system is definitely, obviously, has a very clear normative framework. But I also think that sometimes, you know, scholars or observers tend to uh, overemphasize its determinacy, right? So part of what uh, I've written about is how there's more plasticity in those agreements and that 
therefore governments have more room for maneuver than we often think they do. Mm -hmm. Accepting that the regime is more strict and harder to navigate mm -hmm. than the GATT, for sure, but that is than the pre-WTO GATT system. But that the, we should refute the argument that governments' hands are tied and that they can therefore pass domestic economic mm -hmm. policies, because that's always or often an excuse, right? Uh, pointing to an international agreement on institutions. So I think there's more room there, but in any case, if there was a moment in which uh, the trade system is amenable for reform, it's this one. And so I would say bring some of these views and normative uh, disagreements to bear in the current debate. Um, then Pascal, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I, I would say perhaps I would reframe a little bit the the assumption because I don't think that it's that trade agreements sort of were designed in a world that uh, didn't anticipate global value chains. So I think you're onto something in the sense that there seems to be a lag for sure in the way that the global economy was uh, structured. But I think trade agreements themselves were part of what created these global value chains, right? So in a way they were involved in the, in the production of these chains. And you can see that very clearly in NAFTA. So you have these integrated value chains in North America that at the same time created all sorts of these locations, you know, in Mexico, for example, right, where the internal market now is polarized. But the Mexican leading firms are incredibly integrated with the North American firms, right? And so the question is, OK, what do we do with this, and how do we rethink these agreements. So the rules of origin is just one domain, right? I don't think it, it, it probably helps for the whole picture. But another way to think about it might be what's going on that's been useful in global value chains. And so there, actually, the ILO uh, has a really interesting story to tell, which is what happened in Bangladesh after the Rana the Plus uh, disaster, right? And, and one of these really interesting developments is the, is the uh, accord, which has you know, basically an agreement, an arbitration clause, where the brand companies agree to arbitrate with workers and workers' organizations for the conditions uh, or violations of labor rights by the suppliers. Right? So it structures liability throughout the value chain. In ways, that this is, I think, the frontier, right? Because one of the problems with labor rights is precisely the inability to establish liability with the powerful corporate actors. And so can we think about this in the framework of a trade agreement? I mean, maybe we don't need to, but this might be another avenue for engagement in which we can bring some of those questions to bear in the negotiations of trade agreements, uh, I would say. And then, um, I didn't get your name. Morgan. Pardon me? Morgan. Morgan. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for your question, too, and for bringing in Corinne's, uh, Corinne's comments. Uh, I, what I would say is, and this is in part, partly in response to Corinne, is that I actually don't, don't think about teeth or enforcement as distinct from incentives. I, I think that enforcement uh, actions are a huge part of the floor of incentives, right? So maybe there's a way, uh, and I like her emphasis on, you know, not only <coughs> enforcement and sanctions, but, but, but basically perhaps, you know, prevention or conciliation, all this emphasis on dialogue and seems, seems right to me, but it only seems right if it's done uh, so I'm going to borrow an expression here, which is the bargaining in the shadow of the law, right? The idea that actors bargain knowing what, they're, they are their, what, what their fallback positions are or the consequences of, say, breaching an obligation or defaulting, right? And so here would be dialoguing in the shadow of the law. So dialogue, yes, but only if you can actually point to or have other important levers to pull, right? And so... That's why I think that it's important to think about liability and enforcement, not because that should be your initial go-to place, but because they structure your incentives and your action when you are negotiating and when you're thinking about uh, what they, how to improve conditions of, of work. Uh, and so 
to Corinne's question of, you know, we should think about what kind of labor rights, I would say, yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't think that those labor rights need to be always, you know, hard law, conventional rights that countries adopt. In fact, I think that it's clear that one of the most important contributions of the ILO has been the declaration. That's now used as an international benchmark in all these conventions, right? So soft law that really has had an impact. And so I think that we need to think, yeah, creatively about multiple possibilities. So what are the norms? They might be hard, they might be soft. Who are the actors and the stakeholders that have a, an interest or a buy-in in those norms? And then what are the levers uh, and how are they structured by enforcement mechanisms? And so I think that those are indispensable questions. And for too long, labor has been completely sort of um, out, at least in trade agreements, of access to these levers. And, and so the question is, can we do something to balance that, either by giving labor much more uh, procedural rights that would allow them to uh, sue a state or to bring a case with the trade sanction in mind, or do we diminish those of capital, right? So there are multiple ways of thinking about this, but I do think that it's an important domain, uh, even if we conceptualize it as an investment, as an incentive, sorry. Great. Okay, well, it remains to me to thank all of the participants in this uh, open session of our course uh, for really thoughtful uh, and stimulating discussions that I hope will continue. Turn over to Emily Painter here, who will uh, express the thanks of the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory. Yes, so on behalf of the Labor Law and Development Research Lab, the Truda Foundation, as well as the McGill University Faculty of Law, I'd like to thank our speakers uh, near and far for really thorough engagements with uh, today's question. Um, <laughs> certainly inspiring a lot of uh, deep reflections from our, from our attendees here. And uh, as a small gesture of our appreciation, uh, we would... So we'll pause now uh, for 10 minutes. Uh, there are refreshments outside. And uh, for class participants who are registered in the course, we'll meet back at no later than 3 past 5 <laughs> for our closed session. Thank you very much. And we come to the right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah.